Hey everybody, welcome back to Author Talk. And since we are, I know, I'm gonna blow up the magic of internet video, but those of you who recognize what we're wearing understand that we're shooting multiple videos in one day. So, since I've got both of my friends here and I made a comment that AJ didn't quite know if he believed or not when I said that I had met both of these people at the same place. I don't believe, it wasn't at the same time, but it was at Joseph Beth Booksellers by South Park Mall. Was it really? It really was. Wow. You came in and spoke to a Charlotte Writers Club meeting about their short story contest. I this was in like your the early intro. 14th century. Yes. Yes. I do remember this was that. back when but this looked more like this <laughs> as opposed right. to this looking like that and that didn't exist no, it didn't. No. and i met darren at that same joseph beth upstairs when i was introduced to him and i don't remember if it was a month before or a month later but now how did you guys meet i i was new in town and uh park road books was doing a, a signing for aj and i I was new in town, didn't know him, and I was like, oh, fantasy author, I will go and talk to him. So I, I came to one of your right? signings there at uh, Park Road Books, and I don't remember if it was raining that night, but we ended up chatting for a while. It was a really, it was, it was pretty cool. Because you had to fight the crowds to get in, and, and, and I, I set a special space just I used, I used my special martial arts yeah. moves to navigate the crowd to get to the front of the line. Yeah. You want to talk well, about some special ninja moves? I went to one of your signings at Books A Million at Cotswold on a Saturday afternoon and it was raining buckets. The ninja stealth evasion that all of the people who came into the store did to avoid looking at or speaking to us when we're sitting right there in the front of the store, it was amazing. They did everything but leap over us to get to the six foot tall stack of copies of Fifty Shades of Grey that yeah. they were all there to buy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. store signings can be like that, can't they? Yeah. I, um, I did once, one once when um, the only person to speak to me asked me where the toilet was. <laughs> <laughs> did you know? No, I was like, <laughs> what, no, what, what do you think I, what, what do you, you think, think I'm doing? doing it? That's a, I often ask that question though. In, I went into a Barnes and Noble once in South Carolina. I just happened to be passing, and I went in, and they had some of my books, and I took them in the, and up to the register, and I said to the girl who was working there, I was like, "Do you mind if I just sign these while I'm here?" And she said, "Sure, that, yeah, okay." Only, usually. We only let the author sign them. And I was like, so what do you think is happening? He's like, what's so bizarre? <laughs> I think we need to drill down on that a little because she said usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which not implies. Always. Not always. This is not a 100% solution. I was, like, right. I was like, what, would you like me to sign with Stephen King, J.K. Rowling? Yeah, I guess I'll sign a lot. Oh, well, I've signed so many other people's names in books. I've signed <laughs> books I didn't write. Um, Especially your new identity theft book. Isn't it becoming standard procedure that you don't sign that when you make yeah. somebody else sign it for you? Teresa frequently signs that. And then if I'm at the booth when she signs a copy of identity theft, she'll say this book was not signed by John Harkness. Mm -hmm. And then I go in and say, now it was, and I scribble my name. Now you also went to Con Carolinas for a few years before you were published and a guest. Right. And I was still trying to learn how to do all this. Between Dragon Con and Con Carolinas, I would show up and just sprint back and forth to all the different writer things trying to figure out how to do all this stuff. So I encountered y'all a lot of times doing that. Um, one time I went to the very last Shiva Con that Gail was at and I I think that by the end of it, she's like, "You were at every single, <laughs> you were at every single one of my panels." I was like, "Well, they weren't that many." <laughs> but I was like, "Yeah, I was at every single one because I'm, I'm here to learn." Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember you and Matthew were frequently 
right in the front at every decent writing panel. And I've told a lot of aspiring writers the story about, okay, look, I got these two friends who spent two or three years going to every panel they could find and busting their ass and sitting in the audience. And now they're both on the other side of the table because they absorbed all of that information. You learn. Now, when did you switch from, because you did three thrillers in a row before yeah. you did your first fantasy, published your first fantasy novel. Yeah. Did you start off knowing you wanted to be a fantasy writer? Well, that novel was written before any of the thrillers. Okay. I mean, I, the first one was Act of Will, right? Act of Will, yeah, which false now. Which we have now reissued. Was originally the first edition was published by yeah, by, yeah, by Tor, um, and that book had been submitted and rejected by Tor twenty years earlier. Whoa! Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, I wrote it, I submitted it, it was rejected, and people kept saying, we don't really know what this is, we like it, but we don't know what shelf to put it on. Because in the, when I was writing it, and in the sort of late 90s, there was still the sense that if, if you're writing fantasy, it's elves and dwarves. And there weren't a lot of subcategories, there wasn't room for a lot of anti-epic snark, which is what those will stories are built yeah. on, you know. So yeah, it was. People say, oh, "How did you get the book published?" And I was like, "Well, the market changed." And 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 I, your query letter said said New York and U.S. New York Times and USA Today bestseller by true. the time you resubmitted it. That, that, and that is true, and it is a factor, and it's why they wanted me to use the same name, A.J. Hartley, to publish the fantasy novel. Because I, and I remember saying to my editor, "Do you not want another name?" For if, because these are so different from the thrillers that I'd been writing before. And she's like, no, we, we're we hoping to get some crossover market. I don't think they did. I, I don't think they ever do with my stuff. That's I actually my would be surprised. I would actually be very surprised if they didn't be caught. Yeah. Well, no, you but probably, probably, also, you probably days, went the back. It probably went the other direction. Once you had those out, fantasy readers cross <laughs> genre lines more than thriller readers typically because I'm primarily a fantasy right. reader but I read a ton of thrillers I mean it helps though you think that's representative though? I do actually um, I'm I, not sure but the, the, what I was going to say was that this was what my first novels came out 2005 something like that and most books were still being sold in traditional bookstores right and there's less crossover in that situation because people literally don't know your other books exist. Yeah, because you're not walking down that It's aisle. in a different part of the store, right? right? So they go and they're like, oh, here's A.J. Hartley's new thing. Mm -hmm. No, it's over there, so they don't see it. Whereas online, you put in the name and it all comes up on your Amazon yeah. page or whatever it is, you know? So I, I, I suspect there might be more crossover now than there was back then. That makes sense because I wasn't in the publishing industry back when obviously I wasn't in the publishing industry when traditional bookstores dominated the market because I've never had a whole lot of presence in traditional right. bookstores. So the voice from the ether says, so how did these two goofballs end up with this goofball? <laughs> um, I actually, act of will. Yeah. Right? I harassed you for years yeah. before you gave me that book. <laughs> Well, so and I mean, your son grilled me at dinner that's right, about did. whether or about how I would <laughs> market the book, and, and he I was about eight. At the yeah, time. and I told you at yeah. that time I was like, I don't know who your agent is, Hartley, but you should fire them and <laughs> get your kid. Yeah, um, yeah. So the book was there were two books in that series uh, that were published by Tor, and as was the way it always used to go, you know, the book would be out for a while, and then if it wasn't selling a lot, it would it would eventually go out of print. That happens less now. Well yeah. Because the contracts are structured differently so that if they have if the publisher has an ebook rights, it costs them nothing to keep the book in print and right. it can and they can say, yes, we're still selling several hundred copies a year and that's good enough. Because 
it's no skin off their nose, and they're not printing and storing and shipping physical books like they used to have to, right? And it's and that intellectual property sits on their balance sheet as an asset, right? So when I um, when those books were so this was in that little narrow window before that shift happened, where the books went out of print and I could get the the rights back, and I did a self pub version, and of course, because I'm a publishing and marketing genius. They sold not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so when John's like, I'll take them, and I was like, okay. So I, I talked to my agent, and we're like, yeah. So, so those went to false. And the, and the agent, and your agent was mostly like, I mean, he can't do any worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what, initially, when they were self-pubbed, they were self-pubbed through the agency. I wasn't self-pubbing them right. myself. The agency said, we're gonna take on a little sort of mini self-pub wing for precisely this kind of circumstance. And then that folded after a couple of years because they didn't have the personnel to make it work. It's also a little icky, honestly. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. it's it's fine when it's um, re-releases of things that have gone out of print, but there, we've certainly known cases where agents were steering new releases to their own yeah. self-publishing arm and that that feels really squicky to me if only because it means that they're not trying particularly hard to place it elsewhere which is exactly their job yeah. that's right. what they're there for yeah yeah, yeah. so that's how we, I first published with John um, yeah and Darren um, I don't remember the name of the restaurant where we signed those first couple of contracts but it was really good lunch I'm trying to remember it it's the one right there on 7th and Caldwell, across Caddy Corner from where Heroes Aren't Hard to Find used to be. I would have to give that some thought. That's you, <laughs> you, would walk, you walked there on a lunch break. Right. <laughs> I think it's already changed names twice. At least twice. At least twice. It may be a Sunflower Bakery now, but I'm not 100% sure. But um, I had gone through the several years of rigmarole to obtain a literary agent and then they were working as hard as they could to place my books and we found a small publisher who was owned by a couple who were Ukrainian who were interested in my Fugue and Fable books since they're based on Russian classical music. So that went in that direction but we could never find a home for my fantasy chess series and so it was not long after you had turned Falstaff from being this is what I published John Hartness books under to right. I am now publishing not, We're now going to be a real boy. We're now going, yeah, Pinocchio, <laughs> Pinocchio ta-da. <laughs> so um, I think it was me and Emily were the first two novels. Yeah, you two and were the first. Emily and Sarah had the yep. Changelings Fall book and I had Pond's Gambit and those were the first, it wasn't the first book that Falstaff because that was cinched the first one was Cinch. Which the was second anthology. one, yeah. The second one, I don't remember if it was Changeling's Fall or if it was uh, this giant leap at Schubert's short right. story collection. But, but uh, Changeling's Fall and Ponds Again were in the first two novels yeah. that y'all did, and then uh, they, they, those have gone on to become series with you. And then my other publisher eventually folded, and so you very graciously offered to pick up the Fugue and Fable books and. Uh, so that's how I came to be published through Falsaf. It's kind of like rescues. You know, you see a kitten and they look all forlorn. And you think, well, somebody is mistreating this kitten. Somewhere my books were advertised by Sarah McLaughlin and John picked them up. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's me. And we do have a history of rescuing titles either from going out of print, which we've done several times. Actually, we just redid three more of yours for the print for your thrillers. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yeah. I forgot about that. Right, you know, yeah. the first three books that you published. First, yes, uh, we, yeah, which were published by Penguin. And they were, yeah, they, they were in print for a while and then went out. Uh, and now, now they we are handily them. repackaged. I haven't but seen them yet. But do they exist yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They've I've sold them. They've, they, <laughs> they've, they've, them. They've been out. They, yeah. they have, they they have very lovely covers, and they've been out at various events. And ah, okay. I've seen them leave the table and money to remain behind. Right. Yeah, <laughs> no, they're they're quite good. Um, and 
but we've done that with Night Errant and Night Ascendant from Paul Barrett and Steve Murphy. We've done that with the Menopausal Superheroes series. That was a rescue. From the same publisher as me. From the same publisher as you. Um, there's a bunch out there because for a press the size of Falstaff, when we work on a print-on-demand basis and we work fairly lean on number of staff and uh, the people we're working with, we keep our expenses tight. You know, somebody like Tor, if you sell 20 or 30,000 copies of a new release with Tor, you're not getting, your second book's never coming out because those numbers are terrible for a big press. Those numbers are great for a small press. They're I will take the twenty thousand sales. I, I, we'll I'll take will, two thousand. I will sales. fall on my sword and take the twenty thousand sale mark. <laughs> You'll take year. one for the team. I'll take one for the team. Next All right, year. I'm on it. Y'all out there in the internet, that's uh, Fugue and Fable by Darren Kennedy. If you you heard it here, if we sell twenty thousand copies of his series next year, he'll fall on a sword. I didn't say it was. <laughs> I didn't say it was unsheathed. <laughs> Just to be clear, we also didn't mention that it was on the point. But this is true. Uh, but you know, but between well, the two of us, we could block out enough stage combat. That's it will it be is. on the internet, guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, one one year from today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, please leave a note in the comments if you have a sword you would like for Darren to fall upon. And then send us the receipt for the 20,000 copies of Fugue and Fable that you ordered. And until next time, this has been Author Talk, and we will see you later. Bye.